Hello and welcome to this panel. The title of this panel is Multi-Faith Communications Across Cultures and Traditions, Creating a Universal Language. Before I describe this panel and our panelists, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement and my introduction. My name is Catherine Starr. I was born on the treaty lands of the Sack Fox Nation, one of the Anishinaabe nations who protect the Great Lakes. I was raised on the sacred lands of the Karen Kawa people, and I now live in Toronto, originally called Tekaranto in the Mohawk language. This land is the traditional home and treaty lands of the Huron Rendat, Cree, Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of Credit River. For thousands of years, these people lived, worked, and kept this land sacred. Today, many peoples from many different nations call Toronto home. And this land is still sacred. And we need to work together to protect the land and its resources. Our panelists all come from different lands and are connected to many different peoples. Together, we are members of the URI Spirituality and the Earth Operation Circle, which is one of the first multi-region CCs in the URI. Together, we work towards building better connections between people and our spiritual connect connections to the Earth. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Enoe Texier. She is an anthropologist and PhD in social sciences, the regional coordinator of URI for Latin America and the Caribbean, and a coordinator of the doctorate in social sciences of the Central University of Venezuela. Her topic will be creating a universal language from the multicultural perspective. My presentation is called the language of the heart. I believe it is necessary to co-create the relationships between different voices and cultures. From the semiological perspective, we can understand the concept of culture as meanings shared by humans about internal and external reality. The relation between culture and language is the human capacity to generate signs and symbols. Our neocortex brain plays that role. Symbols are not natural. They are learned during the socialization process. Learning the mother tongue involves not only learn words, but gestures, images of realities, ways of being and acting of the particular culture of the people who raised them. The symbol must be understood only in the cultural context in which it was created and used. Otherwise, we run the risk of misunderstanding the message that the other person is trying to communicate. Language as a cultural expression related to the symbolic representation has two dimensions, the verbal expressed by words and nonverbal with different expressions. What is important to point out is that not only words communicate, Good communication happens when both sender and receiver share the same code and meanings. For healthy communication in daily life, even between members sharing the same language, it is proper to clarify and check it. In multicultural relationships, we must be open-minded and patient to grasp the messages 
and crack the codes if we want to get closer to understanding meanings. From the anthropological differential approach, it is not correct to talk about the culture. We have to talk about cultures because this concept has a plural nature. We must include all cultures, as many as societies exist on earth. This concept has also a dynamic character. It is neither an abstraction nor a finished product. It is the daily experience of human groups in their context. Multiculturalism in this sense is the dialogue in diversity. The symmetrical reciprocity between societies, acceptance of the unity of the humankind, equal rights and duties, ethical commitment to live together. The signs of religions in these post-colonial times need to open the compass. colonial times need to open the compass to the great diversity of human religion traditions and establish dialogue with them. The concept of religion can be properly applied to the Abrahamic religions, but extrapolation are not justified in other spiritual forms, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, paganism, indigenous cosmovision, African religious traditions, etc. The spiritual phenomenon is not about a set of small symbols and techniques to comfort ourselves in the face of life's failures, but what gives us the motivation to lead our humanity to the limit. Religiosity belongs to the order of anthropology, the human being as a seeker of truth, of beauty, of connection with God, the source, the great spirit, the energy, and universal consciousness. We are pilgrim souls traveling this temporary human existence towards the gathering with the light. And there are many cultural pilgrim paths. All of them are treasures in our human experience. We need to reach unconditional love as the start point to relate from a sincere exchange with appreciation of cultural differences and recognition of unity in our diversity. It is necessary to engage with others from our hearts, seeking reciprocity, transparency, the common good, and the joy of living. We living beings are energy as the sun, the stars, and the mountains. A harmonic energy comes from acceptance, appreciation, and inclusion. The next step for me is that we have to work ourselves, all our capacities. Everyone must tune the instrument to co-create the orchestra, helped by the potential of the three brains and the model of multiple intelligence of Elaine de Beauport. 
for the neocortex, she proposes four intelligences that can help us. The rational led us to go to the family worldview, stop judging, erase prejudice, open ourselves to what is strange and aligned to us. The associative intelligence led us to appreciate something about everyone and everything inside and outside our context and even strangers. The auditive intelligence led us to develop the ability of listening with the willingness to understand and or incorporate new meanings. And the intuitive intelligence give us the opportunity to have glimpses of God and to be quiet, receiving information from the universe. For the limbic brain or the emotional brain, she proposed three other intelligences. The affectional one is the door of love. Open us to love anything or anyone in the environment. Developing this intelligence, we can learn how to be moved by a person, experience, feelings, deepening empathy, love, and compassion. The motivational intelligence, which is our internal fire, the flame that moves us, it helps in how to love life also to activate our motivation to maintain enthusiasm and not lose energy when facing obstacles, also learning how to overcome them. With the mood intelligence, we can enter into and shift from any mood, whether we consider the experience painful or pleasurable. Also help us to avoid acting when in difficult feelings. For the reptilian complex or basic brain, as she named it, we have uh, three more intelligences that can help us. Basic one is being able to move toward and away from something or someone freely and appropriately take appropriate action. The pattern intelligence let us to know the pattern that governing our go behaviors and be able to change them when necessary and also help us to manage harmful behavior. The parameter intelligence, which is our sense of belonging, continuity, order, training, and trust, help us to, to be able to transform parameters in tandem with the dynamics of our life. Also, this intelligence let us how to extend new learning until it becomes reliable and help us to connect the deep meaning of beauty and rituals. I want to finish my presentation with a quote of Lane de Bopor and Aura Sofia Diaz from the book, The Three Faces of Mind. Love and peace, so central in the doctrines of all religions, have to permeate from the brain of thought down into the emotional brain and the action brain of each individual if the religious mission is to be successful. Thank you. Gracias. Obrigada. Merci. Our second panelist is Gus Deseriga, PhD 
and third degree Gardnerian elder. He will be discussing Lost in Translation, the problem of definitions. Thank you, Catherine. My first image gives a sense of what our problem is. And that is that interfaith work between many indigenous peoples and modern interfaith Westerners is complicated by the fact that words are translated from what appear to be equivalent terms and moving into different linguistic contexts with their own implications. And thus, as this very old image from Western history shows, the worldview changed when modern Westerners left the animist, the broadly animist world of their ancestors and began exploring reality from a mechanistic um, point of view. And this raises the issue of what is language for when we're trying to communicate from such different worlds. Animals make tools, plan rationally, and exercise foresight, and language is not necessary for thinking, as they demonstrate over and over again. What language does do is make our thoughts available to others through the intervening medium of sound, syntax, and words. But as this happens, we change our relationship with our thoughts and with what the words we use mean. As Walter Ong put it, language is the person's means of entering into the life and consciousness of others and thereby of his own life. Language and changes our thinking as we speak it. And the reason is because it translates thoughts that are not linguistic into a new medium. Every medium for transmitting information influences what is transmitted. Words must stand for thoughts and judgments that often are not ultimately verbal. And nowhere is this more true than in looking at the world as an animate living uh, foundation within which we all dwell. In addition, by connecting our private thought with others' thoughts, language in turn shapes our private thought as we increasingly begin to see the world in its terms. And this raises uh, the first distinction I want to explore. That is a major difference between many Native American languages and Western ones, particularly English, is that they are verb heavy, whereas English is noun heavy. In Potawatomi, um, for example, 30% of its words are nouns and the vast majority are verbs, whereas in English, 70% are nouns and 30% are verbs. So words that we treat as nouns, other cultures often use as verbs. Back in 1970, Buckminster Dr. Fuller caused quite a stir in certain circles when he wrote a book, I Seem to Be a Verb. Many traditional indigenous people might ask, why just people? And this brings me to the work of Robin, Robin Wall Timmerer, a member of the Potawatomi tribe and a scientist who teaches at SUNY Syracuse. Potawatomi divides not only nouns and verbs, differently than English does. In addition, it distinguishes its nouns and verbs between animate and inanimate, whereas Western languages distinguish by gender as his, her, and its. Kimura writes that in Potawatomi, the, verb, the word for a bay depicted here is, I'm not even going to try to pronounce, but is best des described, translated as to be a bay. She explains in English, a bay is water trapped between shores and contained by the word. But if instead it is an active 
verb. The water is active, engaged in relationships that could <laughs> and do change from being a stream to being a bay to the ocean. And this brings me to one very important distinction between these two ways of talking, between things and nodes. English and Western languages in general focus on nouns as objects, like this picture of stones. And objects are largely impervious. The stones can be rearranged. They remain the stones they were in this image. Whereas a language focusing on verbs focuses on relationships. And the nodes in the relationships change depending on what other relationships they play a role in. This brings me to another Native American tribe on the coast of British Columbia. Again, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but a tribal member, Gisela Maria Martin, explains everything in our language, describes what they do or how they're connected to the rest of the world. And so their word for tree, which again, I will not try to pronounce, is actually in English translated as landholder, actively involved in relationships with the land. If we go to another tribe, the Cherokee, an, a Cherokee writer, Brandon Hobson, who grew up in Oklahoma, which is now Cherokee land after their Veil of Tears march, he points out he was entranced by the land, the trees, and he writes that he wants to write about the world and the land in a way in which we might, we Westerners might write about uh, human history. So this is a very, very different way of thinking about relating with the other than human. And when I was looking for a uh, sense to get a grasp of it, familiar to us Westerners, I thought of friendship. Friendship is useful. But if I claim to be your friend because you are useful, I am not your friend. Friends are not primarily perceived as useful. Nor is this simply a, a distinction between Native American and uh, Western languages. A African uh, writer with another name I will not try to pronounce points out that for the Bantu, traditional Bantu, to speak, act, and live as if beings were forces. Forces being, being is force. And he quotes Kiowa writer, Scott Mamaday. You say I use the land and I reply, yes, it is true. But it is not the first truth. The first truth is that I love the land. I see it is beautiful. I delight in it. And so these are two very different ways of experiencing the world, which uh, indigenous spirituality and much pagan spirituality tries to experience as sacred, but which we modern Westerners often have trouble with. Martin Buber helped to get a sense that we don't, these are not mutually exclusive. Speaking of a tree, we can think of it as an object. We can think of it as something to transform into another object. We can think of it very abstractly. But in all this time, the tree remains my object. However, he says, if I have both will and grace in considering the tree, I become bound up in relation to it. The tree is no longer an it. And this is, in a sense, the translation from a Western way of talking about the other than human to a more traditional indigenous approach. The world is spirit is useful, but to use it most wisely when we stand in a respectful relationship with it. The challenge of translation is not insurmountable, as Buber demonstrates, but to be clear with one another, when we appear to be talking about the same thing, we need to be clear about the biases within the languages we speak. And here, there's another level deeper that we can go, because even among traditional indigenous peoples living in an animate world, if 
if you want to really connect, you have to set language aside. As David Abram says, every language shapes what we perceive. And therefore, silence is a way of going into that realm of awareness that is deeper than language. Uh, um, among Northern Native Americans, think of the vision quest, where somebody, a person will sit for several days of fasting alone in an isolated and sacred place, praying for a vision, which may or may not come on the first attempt. And if it doesn't, you do it again. And other spiritual traditions essentially recognize the same thing with their focus on silence and solitude. And so what we can learn as Westerners from indigenous traditions is that the way we see the world shapes how we treat it. And this David Suzuki quote does an excellent job, I think, of explaining how that changes. And as it changes, how our experience of spirituality and spiritual relationships with others changes in turn. Thank you very much. And our third panelist is Morgana Scythov, and she will be discussing the language of ritual. She is a practicing Wiccan priestess, and over the years has facilitated many, a variety of Wiccan groups. For this section of the panel, multi-faith communication across cultures and traditions, creating a universal language, I would like to talk about the language of ritual. A definition of ritual is often described as an act or series of acts regularly repeated in a set precise manner and usually includes a spiritual component. We have habits and routines which people sometimes describe as a, as a ritual. For example, my morning salutations to the sun, a bath ritual, which may indeed have a spiritual aspect or a part of a specific religious routine. If we look at the Ghats of Varanasi in India, how many people there are doing their morning and evening salutations, the ritual bath. However, many of us may talk about our morning ritual, but literally say, I wake up, have a good stretch, have a shower, have a cup of coffee, and then go on to work. Many people will recognize these morning and evening routines as the way in which we welcome the day and say farewell to the night. In the evening, we welcome the night and say farewell to the day. As we remember what has happened during the day, we can reflect and go into the night and perhaps dream about those things which have happened to us, but also to look and claim the night as a place of dreams and uh, the ability to be able to communicate on a very different level. The same too in the morning. Well, as we leave our dream consciousness, we move into day consciousness. And again, it is how we communicate with people, which is important for a successful career or a successful relationship. Rituals bind us together and connect us to this higher consciousness. The word religion literally means to link together. That established religions have a much more dogmatic approach is the re result of centuries of indoctrination. And yet when we look at where and where ritual practice became formal, we can turn to ancient Greece where theatres had for the first time a seating arrangement. Of course, there are many other ancient cultures like Egypt, who also had rituals and many different gods and goddesses. But it was for the first time in ancient Greece when the ritual drama became formalized. Quote, ritual drama might typically be a reenactment re of a myth, such as a fight between a king, god and a monster the disappearance, return, and sacred marriage of a young god 
or wanderings in the underworld. Historians of Greek and Roman drama would naturally like to know much more. A few paintings and relief seem to depict costume performers of ritual drama. Often they were priests or cult members, not professional actors. Masks discovered at religious sanctuaries certainly indicate the existence of religious performances. That they had a religious purpose, it was indeed for the actor who was supposed to give up his identity in order to let another speak and act through him. Indeed, the dramas were performed, before, for example, in honour of Dionysus, the god of ecstasy, which means literally standing outside oneself. Actors, therefore, had to renounce their individuality. The actors thought that the mask itself contained the character and are said to have prayed before putting on their masks. In many other cultures, we also see the use of masks, and very often we see the connection to ancestor worship. Among non-literate peoples who cannot record their own histories, mass rituals act as an important link between past and present, giving a sense of historic continuity that strengthens their social bond. On these occasions, masks, usually recognisable as dead chieftains, relatives, friends or even foes are worn or exhibited. Gifts are made to the spirits incarnated in the masks, while in other instances dancers wearing stylized mourning masks perform the prescribed ceremonies. These are masks from many different parts of the world, from Oceania and Africa, and many of course in the Native American traditions also employ masks. So the masks, the new use of wearing masks and having this connection with a mask is very universal. Using the masks can also have a therapeutic use. They have played an important part in magical religious rites which prevented and tried to cure diseases. In some cultures, the masked members of secret societies could drive disease, demons from entire villages. Today, and in the period of the pandemic, we've also seen that, for example, in India, in societies where there is little money but a lot of talent, people have actually turned to their old gods and the way they communicate with their gods by, for, exa for example, in river deities, calling upon Corona Mai. We see that even today, the gods can be called and used and employed for getting rid of disease or at least protecting us. In the same way, ritual observances can bring about a universal language. We've seen, of course, how when everybody begins to pray together, that there is a resonation. A resonation throughout the world as it reverberates through different layers of consciousness. But also the gestures, the costumes, the masks, the stories and music incorporating the natural cycle of day and night and the wheel of the year and the wheel of life, we can, can participate in the great cosmic play. As we know, many indigenous cultures also follow the wheel of the year as we follow the solstices, the winter and summer solstice and the equinoxes at September for the autumn equinox and in spring round about March for the spring equinox, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. Of course, in the Southern Hemisphere, summer is winter and winter is summer. And yet these particular moments, these moments, whether it's on the solar calendar or whether it's in the lunar calendar, we also see 
that in the lunar calendar, many cultures have also given names to the particular lunar cycle. And even though the names may be slightly different, they always reflect the flow of the natural world from life, death, blossoming, and onto again the transition. As, as we see in autumn, the trees, deciduous trees, their leaves turn to bright arrays of orange and browns as the leaves fall to the ground. Again, we can see these natural processes in all cultures and we all have different ways of celebrating spring or autumn or winter or summer. But many of the stories connected to the Wheel of the Year, connected to the Wheel of Life, the mythology, as Joseph Campbell said, mythology is the language of religion. And as a friend of mine once said, ritual is to an adult what play is to a child. Let's not be afraid to open our hearts to both the tragedy and joy which life brings and communicates us and with our society around us, communicating from our souls, from our hearts. Again, that we join together as we celebrate the wheel of life. Here we can see some of the reference I've given, but it's worth looking at the different cultic theatres and ritual drama, looking at the different cultures, whether it's dance or drama, or whether it's music. Again, the rituals with a spiritual content are universal. And again, we do not always need words. And the words or the sounds bring us together when we listen to the trees, when we connect with those animals and plants and even minerals, again, creating a universal language. Thank you. So thank you all for um, being with us. And I really wanna thank our presenters whose talks really connected one to the other and it showed the depth and the breadth of what communication can do and how we can work to improve communication amongst many different peoples, many different cultures, and through many different ways. So I thank you. I thank um, Enue. Thank you. I thank Gus. And I thank Morgana for your, all of you for your time, your effort, and sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us today. It was a great pleasure. And thank you very much for moderating Catherine. It's been a pleasure working with all of you and wish everybody a pleasant journey through the Parliament in the following days. Thank you. Pleasure to be. Bye. <laughs>